Hello, how is going everyone? Uh, this is Mohamed Jijuli, your instructor for uh, Petroleum uh, Engineering course PTR 3134. And today we'll have a, a lecture on the module one. And module one got two parts. Uh, the first part is about the basic history of the uh, of the codes and specs in petroleum industry and the second part will contain a little bit more technical details so uh, let's um, let's uh, uh, go through the slides um, okay so the first part the history okay so uh, before that the first and foremost important thing is to know about the difference among the codes a uh, standard and a uh, specification okay so do we get three different terminologies remember a code a standard and a specification so what are these so uh, let's start first uh, what is a standard so uh, by definition we know standard is a set of technical uh, definitions and guidelines of how to okay so how to do something an instruction instruction for whom the designers and the manufacturers okay in this case and if you are a plant or a unit operator so it would be a technical guidelines for how to or the instructions for the operators okay that's usually we call standard operating procedure or SOP remember that so that's how these standards come to so standard is something like um, like a written in a few paragraphs or, or, or like I mean couple of hundreds of pages okay uh, written by an expert so this is a, like kind of like a set of instructions so the standards are considered voluntary because they serve as a guideline, okay? It is not enforced by law. For instance, um, you won't be penalized by not following a standard, okay? So there are uh, lots of uh, different international organizations who actually provide these uh, types of uh, standards, or like we call them standardization companies for instance like the uh, standardization organization for uh, so for instance like the ISO you probably heard of it international standard organization um, they have a wide variety of standards about everything okay that's uh, that's uh, their organization is for like standardize every procedure and if they have any new or updated standard they replace the old one to the new one uh, just like that API, American Petroleum Institute, ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, AICH, there are so many organizations, they actually provide the standards. So what is a standard? Again, uh, for an example, API, okay, so this straight organization uh, forms a technical committee. They produce the standards uh, for the items, for instance, the pumps pipelines, uh, flanges, valves, okay. So these plant designers and the operators who actually handle the oil and gas usually follow the recommended practice of API, okay. Now there could be another example, for instance, ASME or ASME, the, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Now um, ASME is like a, is a, it's a standard and lots of manufacturers who actually manufacture different parts. For instance, we're talking about pipeline, okay? So the pipeline manufacturers, they follow the ASME guidelines. So, so uh, let's say this thing, like the API, they follow how to use the pumps, pipelines, uh, the things uh, for the petroleum industries, whereas the ASME, you see, the, the, they actually concentrated on the manufacturing. So that's why I said like different types of uh, standard, I mean, different types of job, different types of um, uh, 
uh, requirements from the standard organizations okay standardized organizations so um, so the ASME for instance they actually provide stamps and that stamp uh, clarifies like that is accredited the manufacturers in place of their products indicating the product was manufactured according to a standard and how these uh, stamp would look like? The stamp would look like something, something like this. Okay, let's uh, make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so this is um, this is a spam of ASME. So we did it like this, certified by and the pressure, temperature readings, and everything like the um, maximum and minimum uh, temperature and pressure working and manufacturer seals and what are all the things all the certifications and markings are given in there so it's a kind of like a trademark uh, as we actually give to the manufacturers to make sure like the whole manufacturing process went accordance with the standard set by ASME that means it's a good product right so that's what the standard is for now, why it is necessary? Well, uh, let's um, see what STM said. STM is another organization. It's called American Society for Testing and Materials. So it says, standards are a vehicle of uh, communication for producers and the users. They serve as a common language, a common term. Okay? that define the quality and establishment of the safety criteria. Now, um, what do you mean about the common term and the, uh, like the quality and the safety? For instance, um, the same safety standard in manufactured in China could not be same uh, for the North America or like the safety culture of the Middle East would not be the same like Europe or North America, okay? But if a Chinese vendor or a manufacturer, they say my product is manufactured according with ASME, then would have a confidence like, yes, um, it's um, they actually uh, followed the same procedure. And that's why like uh, the, uh, the quality of the product would be not questioned. Okay, so that is that is actually meant by the first uh, sentence, and the costs are lower if the producer um, are standardized, and the training is also simplified, and consumers accept products more readily when they can be judged on intrinsic merit. Okay, so this is a very important part. Like I mean, if the, if you follow a standard procedure. The manufacturing cost would be lower, the productivity would be higher, and the training would be simplified, and the customers or like the end users, the consumers, they would have more trust on your product. Okay, so that's why standard is very important. Now we have learned about standard, like uh, and as I said, standard is a volunteer procedure. So. If that is standard, then what is code? Now, code is a type of standard. It is a standard that has been adopted by one or more government bodies uh, and that forces by law and when it has been incorporated in your business contract. Code provides a set of rules that specify the minimum acceptable level of safety and quality for manufactured, fabricated, and constructed goods. Codes also refer out to standards or specification for the specific detail on additional requirement that are not specified in the code. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's give you a, um, a simple example. For instance, you probably heard of the fire code or the electrical code, uh, the construction. Okay, so what is that? That is like when you build a building or you build a 
place so it should be uh, safe enough that it don't catch any fire so the first thing we actually do like uh, put a fire alarm okay if you go any public places like I mean any uh, government buildings or apartments or anything you'll find a fire alarm attached in there why because it's we need with the code it is the law okay so code is something that has been adopted by the government bodies now it could be the provincial government it could be the federal government or it could be a city or town but it is adopted by a government body now um, ASME is one of the oldest and most respected standard development organization and ASME that so many standards that has been adopted as uh, by laws in the United States so that means is maybe those uh, standards became the codes okay so the ASME codes are legally enforceable in many US states whereas the other parts of the world they are not legally enforceable for instance in China okay uh, it's not uh, legally enforced but uh, for instance in uh, New York it is um, uh, it should be legally enforced so in case of New York it is a code in case of China it is just a standard okay so um, if you want to find out more you can actually go and click um, this link and to find like different codes and standard that ASME got for instance process piping okay ASME uh, B31.3 um, it is a standard, um, I mean, a code for the pressure piping, okay? So we'll actually go through that B31. So this is uh, an uh, example of a code. Now, um, there are uh, lists, uh, so some acronyms. There are so many organizations, as I said. So uh, please go through these organizations and you will find it very interesting. And these are very important. For instance, uh, uh, ANSI or ANSI, American National Standard Institute, OSHA, Occupation Safety and Health Act, okay, uh, NEC, National Electrical Code, um, IEEE. Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, they, they got um, the transactions also, IEEE transactions, NSPA, Fire Production Agency, and they got lots of like fire codes. So uh, go to all of these and uh, please remember the, the name of the organizations. Now we have learned about standards, we have learned about codes uh let's learn about specifications or we sometimes call it specs so what is a specification so the specifications provide a specific or additional requirements uh, for the uh, materials the components or service that beyond requirement to the code start standard that means it is totally voluntary it's not even a standard it is just um, a requirement of your from your could be from your customer could be from your vendors okay so it allows a purchaser to include a special requirements as per design uh, and uh, service level condition it allows customizing your product as long as it complying with the code okay so this is a specification sheet uh, for a steel pipeline. Uh, I just connected from the internet, so you will find like a, um, a steel company, a pipeline company actually, uh, uh, if a specification uh, to the manufacturers, like how the pipeline would be. So what are in there? Like, I mean, they specified the diameter, of course, uh, the length, the material of the constructions, and the construction, the, the standard descriptions, and there they mentioned like preferably they have to follow these uh, standards. So, so these are all uh, uh, types of like uh, uh, product specifications. Okay, so um, 
what are the differences among code standards and specification uh, so it is a kind of like um, uh, uh, a short form of like the all the slides like summary of the slides so the code is enforced by law or contract and standard is uh, globally accepted how to do the instructions and specifications are the requirement within the contract so it is not legally obliged it is just a, a requirement from um, from uh, between the two different bodies okay code is written or approved by a government bodies but standards has been written or approved by um, uh, organizations or it could be a government bodies it could be um, specifications mostly to the private companies okay code uh, included the guidelines for design fabrication construction installation and safety of course uh, standard is a set of technical definitions uh, guidelines for manufacturing and constructions also um, specifications uh, are like the additional requirements beyond specified in the codes and standards uh, some examples of code like ASME, uh, British Standard, NFPA, uh, and some example of the standards like uh, ISO, ASTM, and the specifications like Shell DEP, it's uh, kind of like a uh, Shell got their own design and engineering practices uh, uh, specifications, or there are lots of other different types of specifications. Okay, so the more we'll go to the um, course will learn about these things. Identifying code standards and specifications, like uh, how we would identify like uh, um, the code st standards and specifications. So how it actually works is uh, the first we have the acronym, acronym for the organization, and then we have the specification number. Uh, Dash, uh, followed by the year so the acronym is the organization which developed the code or adopted the code I mean <clears throat> adopted uh, the course <clears throat> specification is um, alphanumeric identifier for instance in this case B31.3 and year is the latest version always change okay so um, the regular interval we always update uh, the uh, versions now some of the codes and standards uh, could share a joint responsibilities for instance um, this uh, ASME and NSI or NC okay so they have the same standard like the, say, they say they, they actually developed together Okay, so you'll find lots of like ASME uh, codes or the standards, they have the uh, same shared name uh, like that. Um, okay, so let's learn a little bit um, about the codes, like the historical perspective. So maybe some of you actually know the codes of Hammurabi. So Hammurabi. He was a founder of the Babylonian Empire. Babylonia is now somewhere, some part of Iraq, Syria, and uh, probably a part of Jordan uh, and Iran too. So there's a vast empire actually built up. Uh, so uh, that is uh, an ancient empire. Uh, I mean, way ancient than even the Greeks. So, so the Hammurabi, he uh, was known as an effective leader, wrote the earliest known code of law. And the portion of the Hammurabi's code um, of law dealt with the building construction. Okay, how is that? So, number 229, if a builder has built a house for a man and his worker is not strong, and if the house he has built falls in and kills the householder, the builder shall be slain, that means killed. 
uh, if a builder has built a house uh, for a man and his work is not done properly and the wall shifts then the builder shall make a wall cool his own silver his own money um, so as you can see like this is kind of like really harsh uh, if a builder build a house and uh, if the uh, householder actually get killed so the builder will be uh, prosecuted and would be slain so thanks God we don't live at the time of Hammurabi for eye for eye like eye for an eye that kind of law is abolished but that was the first step like uh, some codes have been started okay now later on we have um, Roman lead pipes like the Romans Romans actually did a tremendous work in terms of uh, plumbing systems like Roman plumbing system it's is still like I mean working that's very very interesting but it's still working it's it's really crazy working means uh, it's uh, still in there like I mean if you dig up uh, some new discovery like archaeological discovery area and you'll find like still the uh, Roman you will find like the Roman lead pipes are still in there so it's amazing. So how they actually manage this vast uh, water supply network. Um, so this is because they actually followed a standard. Okay, so you can see this inscription. This is this inscription is uh, something reminded like uh, the ASME stamps. You remember? So it is something like that. So what's happened? Like the method of manufacturing the lead pipes recorded by uh, Vitruvius and Frontinus, uh, the lead pipe poured into the steel with a uniform three meter length and it would be bent from a cylinder and soldered in a seam. Okay, seam means like, uh, um, what is seam? Uh, I will actually show you, uh, uh, you will actually get to learn about this thing, sorry. So seam is something like, uh, for instance, this is a pipe. Okay, and here is a joint of the pipe. Okay, so you actually treat the kind of uh, um, here it is. The join and uh, for instance you um, if you observe a pipe uh, in many cases you'll find it's a welding joint okay so this welding joint these we called seam okay and if a pipeline don't have the welding joint we call it seamless pipeline okay so this is called seam now um, so the pipe this lead pipes uh, these could range size from 1.3 centimeter up to uh, 57 centimeter or 22 inch in diameter so it's, it's really big right depending on the requirement or the rate of flow so this is another uh, example of the notes uh, we probably heard about Nero okay so that's a saying like when Rome is burning, Nero is uh, playing fiddle. Um, but Nero is not a crazy person. I mean, the history actually said like Nero is a crazy person, but he is not. What he actually did is something different. Like Nero burned Rome uh, purposefully. Why? So Emperor Nero had a master plan for the construction of a new Rome. Prior to Nero's ascending the power, Rome is lavished with his wealth, resources, everything. But what's the problem? They ignored the construction regulations. So, so many buildings have been collapsed, people killed, and maimed all lots of like workmen. Then Nero have realized like um, he got to build destroy everything and building again from the scratch. So Nero deliberately ordered Rome's destruction 
until the downfall of the Roman Empire, uh, the construction was closely monitored and controlled. So, uh, what's happened in the hindsight, it could be the states that, that room burning might have been the world's first urban renewal program. Uh, it's a very interesting and fascinating story because we probably heard lots of bad things about NATO, but not every destruction is a bad thing. It's uh, something makes like a phoenix bird, like uh, uh, making something good, okay? Um, in 1666 AD, don't look at this uh, last digits, I mean, that's ominous. <laughs> so the Great Fire in London. So London had a major uh, conflagration in, uh, in these years, but the fire in 1666 is it's singled out because um, it resulted the British government's adaptation of the building controls. Other than that, what's happened, again, just like Rome, they didn't follow any codes or standards, but after that, they have realized they have to follow the standards and that they do that. Now, um, here is the thing. Um, we need to know uh, about the um, about the Canadian code. So, what's happened in 1907? Uh, Quebec Bridge has been collapsed. So the bridge has been collapsed into the Saint Lawrence River in just 15 seconds. You can see the picture. It's pretty damaged. And of the 86 workers on the bridge, 75 were killed and rest were injured. This shook the entire nation. And then, uh, Canadian government um, uh, strictly adopted the code. Um, and what's happened? Uh, the engineers they took the oath and they found the ritual, uh, and that ritual is named as the calling of an engineer. And it's authored by the famous British Indian um, um, writer Rudyard Kipling, probably. Have seen his movie Mowgli. <laughs> so uh, the Iron Ring Oath. It's um, it's um, it's a sign that you are a registered engineer in Canada. And this Iron Ring. It, this this um, this ceremony is really phenomenal. It's a kind of like you. Um, it's called the calling of an engineer, and you uh, joined and you touch the iron and say speak the oath. In the middle of the hall with everyone it's very very amazing and this ring actually made um, the with the steel of this uh, collapsed bridge okay so it's a specially forged ring and it is a kind of like um, remember that uh, before designing anything an engineer should look upon this ring and remind it that it's or her oath so yeah um, now, at the modern times, um, why we actually follow the codes? Because, uh, you know, like the water heaters or the boilers. So, in 1900, like uh, uh, more than 100 years back, when we didn't follow any codes or any standards or anything. So, at that time, each and every day, there was a boiler explosion and that results uh, nearly like I mean two and a half deaths I mean per explosion okay so the, uh, that means like uh, for two explosions five deaths something like that now you can see this graph it shows like the year the timeline and the date we adopted the code so the day we have started adopting the codes. From there, you can see the boiler pressure has been increased tremendously, but the death toll has been decreased tremendously. Like in 1990s, it's almost zero. There is no explosion. They happened uh, due to the boiler. Okay, now it became a fairy tale, like a boiler explosion. But once it was a 
it is a predominating case right all this happens due to that we actually followed a standardized uh, mission okay so that's exactly why we need to follow the codes so in these lectures we have learned about different codes standards and specifications okay now let's go to the part two and the part two is the codes in petroleum industries a detail of our first lecture so uh, there are different types of codes uh, for different types of operations, different types of uh, units. Um, for instance, uh, for the piping, piping one of the major um, uh, area in oil and gas, okay, or in, in, in any other sectors, in any sectors, in manufacturing also, in chemical uh, plant productions, everything. So piping is very, very important. That includes the plumbing, okay. So the piping, um, it serves the um, very the fluids. It uh, works with the uh, high temperature, pressure, um, and apart from these operating conditions, uh, the material is very important. Both the fluid materials, what we actually flow through the pipeline, and also the material of the constructions, okay, and the risk factors that has. So there's a code, the ASME B31. It solves the problem. Now, within the ASME B31, we have different segments and as we have different piping standards. For instance, B31.1, it got the power piping. 31.3, process piping. 31.4, pipeline transportation system for liquid hydrocarbons or other liquids. It could be um, crude oil any other different types of liquids, okay? 31.5, refrigeration piping, the heat transfer components. 31.8, natural gas transmission and distribution piping systems, okay? 31.8S, system integrity of the gas pipeline. It is very, very important. We'll go through this uh, in details later on. 31.9, building the service piping. 31.11, slurry transportation piping. 31G1991, the remaining state of a corroded pipeline. That's the manual for determination of the uh, corroded pipeline. So these are the um, standards, uh, the ASME co codes for the piping. There are some other codes and standards for the piping too, and these are very, very important apart from the ASME. For instance, CSA Z662. So CSA Z662 is a Canadian standard. CSA means Canadian standardization. So CSA Z662 uh, is a oil and gas pipeline system. NC B16.5 for the pipeline components. Okay, so there are standards for the pipelines and there are standards for the pipeline components too. So what is the difference between pipeline and pipeline components? For instance, um, the Mm, just one second. I don't know why this thing always popped up like that. So this is a pipeline, okay? Uh, this is a pipeline because it's just a main body of the pipeline. But the components, for instance, um, uh, like a valve, okay? So sorry again. Uh, like a valve. So that could be a pipeline component or a T or an elbow, for instance, this is an elbow, okay? So these are the pipeline components apart from the main pipeline. So um, for these, we have different um, standards too, codes and standards too, uh, like API 6A, uh, specification for the wellhead, uh, NSCE, the control of external corrosion of the underground or submerged pipeline. NFPN 59A, uh, standard for production, storage, and handling of LNG. So there are different types of uh, standards. Uh, we're talking about uh, 31 point uh, B31 
Uh, so B31.3 among all these uh, components B31.3 it actually covered the process pumping which is one of the most important and widely used uh, code okay so let's uh, learn a little bit more about it so what are the scopes what are the contents and what is the coverage of this SME B31.3 on the process piping so the rules for the process piping have been developed considering the piping typically found in petroleum refineries chemical pharmaceutical textile or cryogenic any types of process industries okay this code prescribed the requirements for material and components design fabrication assembly erection examination inspection and testing it means like the wide variety from the design to manufacturing to um, erection testing inspection as well as uh, how you can actually overall everything actually uh, prescribe okay so this code applies to piping for all different types of fluids including raw and unfinished or finished chemicals petroleum products steam air water gas fluidized solids coolants cryogenics so any anything okay so since this uh, 31.3 encompass many things what actually um, it do not cover the exclusions so the exclusions are clearly mentioned in here look at those exclusions okay so the exclusions are the piping with an internal design pressure between 0 to 15 psi okay if the design internal pressure is that it do not follows to be 31.3 it will go to other power boilers and BEP Okay, power boilers or BEP, which is required to be accordance with B31.1. Okay, the BPV, uh, boiler and pressure vessel code, they will follow. Tubes inside the fire heater, again, like the, uh, for the tubes, it will not uh, follow this code because it got other uh, different codes. Uh, like here, you can... Uh, See, sorry. Um, where is that? Yeah, uh, refrigeration piping and heat transfer component. It got other, another different. Uh, okay, for like the pressure vessels, heat exchangers, pumps, and com compressors, this one follows. So remember these exclusions. Okay, exclusions for the process piping. Okay, so anything like you you want to design a uh, process vessel you would follow another code not 31.3 uh, probably uh, preferably you can you can actually uh, see like the low pressure uh, storage tank API and API 620 or even any in any other types of the codes we can have but not that okay so is that these are the exclusions um, at this stage um, we'll um, see how to design how to um, design a, a pipeline but as you can see like the when we actually talking about the code one of the most important thing we um, ask about the, the process piping is it's uh, manufacturing and um, the first stage of manufacturing a pipeline is to design a pipeline and also um, uh, check like I mean what is the required thickness of the pipeline which is very very important why it is very important because the first thing you need to decide of designing something is its thickness and the second thing you decide what is the construction material and the third is the process of uh, construction and fourth is the 
after you construct the mode and the method of inspecting for the faults okay so these are uh, the steps so the first thing uh, when we design any pipeline even vessels or anything so this is the formula we should actually use okay so what is that the design criteria uh, are required thickness calculation a process pipe wall thickness should be at least 87.5 percent of the minimum thickness so this is the formula for the minimum thickness what is minimum thickness minimum thickness is something of um, of um, of a pipeline need the uh, the minimum thickness to to run these the operation okay so for instance you have determined a uh, thickness for the pipeline and after that you have to add a corrosion allowance okay we call it mechanical allowance or corrosion or erosion allowance okay and then it would be the minimum thickness of the pipeline so that means when you determine the pipeline thickness using the formula after that you add the extra thickness so it is a type of safety feature okay and then you got the minimum thickness that's we called the minimum thickness okay so um, this corrosion allowance or mechanical or corrosion or erosion allowance it could be given in inch or millimeter usually it gives the, uh, the, uh, the specification sheet from the customer it's mentioned if it's not mentioned or if it's not says like uh, um, the operation is in very corrosive environment or non corrosive environment it's nothing has been mentioned will actually um, guess a typical value okay and the typical value is 0 0.062 inch remember that so uh, how we can calculate the minimum thickness of a pipeline you should add the determined thickness plus the corrosion allowance now how we can determine the thickness at first to calculate the minimum thickness we have to determine the thickness of the pipeline so this is the formula we can actually use okay so t equal to pyd over the 2 sew plus py so s is the stress of the material um, at a design a certain design temperature you can get it at the s maybe table a1 and the uh, value can be given at psi or ksi or kpa so uh, this is very important okay the unit remember that um, e is the quality factor this is another factor you can get it at the ASME table i have already uploaded the ASME uh, table the resources section of the module one please uh, go and check that uh, w is the wheel joint straight factor so for 510 degrees celsius or less it would be one and for 0.5 for 815 degrees celsius and linearly okay so for instance they are manufacturing um, uh, temperature is 400 degrees celsius that means it would be one but if it's uh, some somewhere like 800 degrees Celsius, okay, so it will be something like 0.49, okay. okay. Why uh, coefficient used to account um, um, uh, for material creeping? So you can actually get it from the table three or four. So these all the tables you can actually get the process piping. Uh, I will just show you one example how to do that. So I will actually show you later on like how to uh, um, how to um, determine the values from the table okay so these are the table so uh, let's let's do an example let's do an example so the problem definition is uh, find the minimum thickness of uh, 8.625 inch of outer diameter pipeline 
okay so we have to find the minimum thickness the design pressure is given 165 psi temperature is also given uh, 675 degree Fahrenheit service is for the superheated steam in power plant um, and the design is a straight ERW electric resistor weld a pipeline we'll know we'll know about these uh, later slides the material type is A53 grade A okay now what types of information we have we have pressure we have uh, temperature which is given which is nice we can actually relate to that we have the diameter we have um, we can determine the S E and W so we can actually use this this uh, to A this formula we are not actually using to B in most cases we will just use to A not the to B why because uh, if the inner diameter is given only in uh, instead of the outer diameter only in that case we will just use the to B if the outer diameter is given then we don't need to use the uh, to B we just directly can use this uh, to A okay and um, if y is not given but the inner diameter is given then we can actually determine y by using this formula okay so let's uh, see in this case um, the first thing we need to do is to specify like we have the temperature we have the pressure we don't have the SEW okay so these are the values we need and the temperature is given uh, it's uh, less than 510 degrees Celsius okay uh, 510 degrees Celsius means 950 degree Fahrenheit but the temperature is 675 that means the W is equal to 1 so we need to obtain the stress the E and the Y value now we can find the S in table A okay let's see the table A so this is the table A1 and as you can see there are lots of different types of material is given but here you see spec non specification number I have F material A53 okay it's already I mean this uh, this asked me B31.3 document and it's at the page 142 so it's already uploaded at the research section please go through that so you can find it in there so if it is so the temperature uh, is here 300 and a specific field is given in KSI remember KSI means kilo PSI okay that means 1000 PSI that means 24 KSI means 24 times 1000 PSI so our temperature is uh, 675 degree Fahrenheit but it's 300 so what we'll do we'll go to the next page uh, 675 so we got 650 700 uh, type FA 53 right type FA 53 okay so here so it's in between 14.8 to 14.5 so if we interpolate in the middle so it would be something like 14.6 something that KSI okay so that means uh, in between 14.4 and 14.5 sorry so uh, we just took the average and we get the value 40,000 psi that means 14.45 ksi means 40,000 psi k for kilo okay and in the similar way uh, we found the from the table a1b for a53 Pipe, uh, we the E value is 0.85, okay, and find in here the for the A53 the electric part is 0.85 here. You see, A53 type E 0.85 here, right? And um, for the carbon steel, uh, the for the ferritic uh, 304 uh, table the 304, we'll find the the table two four is not given but uh, the value is we have determined and that is 0.4 okay so if we plug all the information in here now and remember the units of course so we got the t 
which is 0 0.057 inch so our problem is done is it really no it's not because we have to calculate the minimum thickness but where is the C the C or like the factor the corrosion factor is not given so when it is not given in that case what we need to do we will add a typical value okay will the typical value is 0 0.0625 inch so the minimum thickness we calculated 0 0.0576 plus 0 0.0625 the thickness of the pipeline would be a minimum 0.12 inch okay so that is how we calculate the minimum thickness of a pipeline so uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, all about uh, today's lecture. So what we have learned, we have gone through the difference among the code standards and specifications. We actually went through a little bit historical background of the codes and what is the uh, why it's necessary. Okay, that's uh, the thing. And we have learned about different types of the code we use in oil and gas pipeline systems, um, and then within those different pipelines we select one the process piping and then we have learned a little bit more on the process piping like its scope its content and the coverage and the exclusions okay that's what we have learned and we also have learned by using this uh, asme b31.3 process piping code uh, how to design uh, the thickness uh, pipeline using the charts okay so these are all the things we have learned today's class so um, um, we'll actually um, uh, stop it here now so uh, please go through the lecture again and we'll have a live session soon and during the live sessions we'll have uh, discussed on uh, if you have any types of questions regarding module one okay so have a good day everyone and see you at the live session goodbye and stay well stay safe